And thanks for joining us. I am Tamara Scott. You are listening to Truth For Our Time. We thank Webcast One Live Studios for the studio space. On Fridays, you can join us at 10 a.m. Central Time and 99.3 The Truth Network on Sundays at noon in Central Iowa. Thank them for sharing the air with us. Joining me today is Gary Bauer, and so I want to jump right to our phone line with Gary Bauer. I'll come back and talk to you about some of the current events later. But Gary Bauer, most of you know that name, served with, I think, the Reagan administration, worked with Dobson on focus on the family. Uh, Recently, uh, we recognize him from Christians United for Israel. He started the Action Fund, the lobbying arm of of the organization, and also, I think, Congress— uh, is it Congress for Working Families or American Values? Gary, which one is it? Uh, well, we have a political action committee called uh, Campaign for Working Families okay. and then a public policy group called American Values. You have your finger in pretty much everything. <laughs> or you could just say I'm buried. <laughs> you, well, but you have you have your thumb on the pulse. You know what's happening. And so I, want, I have like a list Gary, uh, probably 15 things I want to ask you about, and we only have 20 minutes with you. I thank you for that time, so I want to hop right to it. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about is the Black Lives Matter is accusing Israel of genocide, and they are now co-opting the BDS movement. For our listeners, BDS is uh, boycott, divest, and sanction Israel. Well, you're, you're absolutely right, Tamara. Uh, and now, look, I, I'm sure your listeners know that there's a big debate in the United States about the criminal justice system, and, uh, and you know, there's, there's been controversial police shootings, and then there's been this terrible wave of attacks on police that, where literally police are being assassinated. So the Black Lives Movement, uh, you know, is in the middle of a, of a, a very significant issue in the United States. I, my instinct is to stand with the police who do an incredible job every day under difficult circumstances. But what's so troubling and I think uh, concerning and, and puzzling is that the Black Lives Matter movement has now issued a platform. It came out uh, the beginning of this week. And it's it's uh, over a hundred pages long, and it's it gets into all kinds of issues, uh, gay rights and transgenderism and so forth. But the, more importantly, it, it takes repeated shots at Israel, the only uh, real ally of the United States in the Middle East, and the only country in the Middle East that respects human rights, is racially and ethic, ethnically diverse, and uh, there, there's not one word in the platform about critical of Hamas or Hezbollah or of Iran, but there's all this language uh, attacking Israel and using, quite frankly, very anti-Semitic arguments. So I, I think Martin Luther King would be uh, heartbroken because he was a very big uh, fan and supporter of Israel and the U.S.-Israel alliance. I think he would be heartbroken to see that this group that says it's about uh, reforming our criminal justice system has now gone on this uh, tirade against the, the nation of Israel. And it seems to me that they don't really even know what's happening in Israel. I don't think that they have a clear picture. I didn't, I've not seen the, the, the platform you're talking about. For our listeners and our viewers, where could they or might they see that platform? Well, um, I, I, you better have hours and hours and hours on your, on your hands, but uh, you can Google it online, Black, Black Lives Matter uh, platform. I think it was released on August 1st. Uh, I stopped printing it off at about 75 pages, but uh, there's actually a delegation of the group in Israel right now, and they've held several press conferences uh, attacking Israel and accusing Israel of of oppressing the Palestinian people. Um, so it, it's looking more and more as if that organization is just another far left group. Uh, that uh, supports all the far left causes. It, by the way, it, it it not only calls for the United States to end our uh, our military alliance with Israel, but it calls on the United States to cut our own military budget by fifty percent at a time that we're fighting radical Islam all over the world. So this is a 
a very negative development, and it's it's further evidence of a bizarre alliance that is growing up between some radical groups like Black Lives Matter and and the Palestinian cause, which is a really strange uh, strange bedfellows. And for our listeners and viewers, some of them may have seen the video. I don't know if you have, Gary, where the father puts his, I think, four-year-old son uh, in a place of danger in front of the IDF, the Israel Defense uh, Force soldiers, wanting his son to be shot. He's he's kind of egging on the Israeli folks to, to shoot his son. And instead, the little boy is walking towards the soldiers, and they reach out a hand, give him a high five, and show him love. Totally foiled the dad's plan, but how, for for the rest of us, we just can't fathom. We just don't understand this type of fanatical hate. No, it's it's very hard to understand, and, and uh, a, a lot of our media and even some of our government leaders uh, doesn't make it easier to understand. They, they're part of the confusion because they keep uh, coming up with excuses or other explanations for... Uh, radical Islam and, uh, and and the wave of attacks that we are seeing uh, both here in the United States and, and around the world. I, I recall a, a year or so ago uh, a story that came out of an area of Iraq that was under the control of, uh, of radical Islamists, and, and uh, the, the director of a home for mentally challenged children were taking these children and putting uh, suicide belts on them and then driving them to various targets where they would drop them off. Uh, how, how can you possibly explain or rationalize doing something like that? Uh, a few years ago, there was a story out of Israel about a, a, a Palestinian young woman who had a, a severe heart defect. The only place it could be treated was in an Israeli hospital. The uh, Israelis treated the young woman. They did this very complicated surgery. They they handled all the medical expenses. And a couple of years later, that same young woman was found trying to uh, sneak into Jerusalem to do a bomb attack at the hospital where she was, where her life was safe. So we're talking about a degree of of hatred. Uh, that it's hard for normal people to understand. The, you know, sometimes when there's an arrest and these attacks or these attempted attacks, the, the media or government authorities will say, well, no, this didn't have anything to do with Islam. This person is apparently insane. Well, I would argue that radical Islam is insane. And uh, if we start just calling it insanity instead of identifying what's motivating it, then we're we're really going to continue to be caught by surprise about how deep this hatred runs. And, of course, you're talking uh, just yesterday, I believe it was, in London, American uh, professor's wife, blonde, killed by one man. We would call it a lone wolf. And they're saying it wasn't necessarily terrorism, but he was a Somali. And don't we believe him to be Muslim? Yes, he's definitely, uh, Somalia is overwhelmingly Muslim. He's definitely a Muslim. He had um, uh, traveled to or, or had been a refugee accepted in Norway. So by the today, yesterday, they were describing him accurately as a Somalian Muslim. Uh, today, they're describing him as a Norwegian with mental problems. And again, it all gets back to um, a lot of our elites uh, w- wanting to do everything they can to make sure there's not... Uh, growing anger at, uh, at at Islam and at radical Islam instead of telling us the truth and letting us make our own judgments about immigration policies and, and related issues. And, of course, we've talked on this show for years about the government being involved in in uh, the, the, the whatever the criteria are for deciding whether or not someone mm. is mentally ill, yeah. being able to... De- to claim whether someone's mentally ill, taking away voting rights for the mentally ill. This is a whole dangerous area where I do not want to see the government whatsoever. Who decides the test? Who decides what's on the test? Who decides who will be tested? It's a totally dangerous area I don't want to see government in, and we see it coming through the gun control area as well as what you're talking about now with this, um, how we define those who would do us harm. And, 
what, what we're also talking about here, Gary, is the deception. There's never been so much deception in our media, which makes me wonder um, if you go back to ISIS, and now I'm really going down a rabbit trail, but if you go back to ISIS, there is a goddess by the name of ISIS, and there is a statue at the Henry Hoover, at the Hoover Museum right here in Iowa of ISIS. It's a quote very similar to Revelations about I am that I am, and then it says that no one has lifted the veil, and the veil is the veil of deception. And it's the veil of deception we're now seeing over this Islamic issue where they won't tell the truth, but also in our media in general. Gary, I see uh, just rolling through my Facebook this morning, Snopes I've never used. I don't trust them. I found great guests by what they say is not true. And I call, I do a little research. It turns out to be true. They are nothing more than an apologist for the liberal left. The media is now, I refer to them, uh, the media, a.k.a. also Hillary support staff. We've never seen so much deception and not telling the truth. The Iran deal, four hundred million now given to Iran's last January. What are your thoughts on that? You know, it's it's just extraordinary uh, what what's been going on. Uh, uh, just just try to imagine this, and I, I think a lot of Americans are kind of shocked this morning reading about it. So the, the Obama administration uh, is in negotiations with Iran on a nuclear deal. Hillary Clinton was the one that uh, opened the door to Iran for those negotiations. Uh, she's been bragging about that during her presidential campaign. Uh, during the negotiations, all the concessions were from the United States. Iran gave up virtually nothing. It doesn't stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. They actually, It actually guarantees they right. will get one right. uh, within the next decade. But now there's this story that at the same time, Iran released uh, four prisoners that they were holding, American prisoners, and at the same time, we were sending Iran $400 million in cash on an unmarked plane, which took off from the United States and landed in Tehran, delivering to probably the biggest supporter of terrorism in the world, uh, Iran, this $400 million in cash. Now, just imagine what $400 million could do in improving things in Iowa or Illinois or Kansas or any U.S. state. And here we are sending it to the U.S. haters and, and Israel haters, uh, the revolutionary government of, of Iran. The president yesterday was making all kinds of excuses and obfuscating. No, it wasn't ransom. No, it was related to a lawsuit that we thought we could lose. And just uh, doing what they usually do, which is put up a, a smoke screen. Uh, but in Iran, they knew exactly what it was. The Iranian media described it as ransom. And uh, and since that money was delivered and our hostages were released, the Iranian government has taken new American hostages. Why wouldn't they? Because they've now learned that our current government uh, is willing to pay them ransom to get hostages back. So all we've done is put more Americans at risk instead of uh, uh, standing up to the Iranian government and, uh, and, and not doing deals with people that want uh, our country to be destroyed. Well, and we have laws against this. You were in the Reagan, I think it's the Reagan administration. Mm -hmm. um, if this were such an above-board idea, why did they go to such lengths to keep it buried underground? Uh, yeah, it, it, you're exactly right. I mean, the, but why was the plane unmarked? Why was the money? It was not even in U.S. dollars. It was converted to uh, euros, and uh, and I forget what the other currency was. Uh, no, you're exactly right. Look, the, the, the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee said today that he still hasn't gotten a briefing from the State Department or the White House on exactly what was done that weekend and why this money was being delivered in cash. And, and by the way, Tamara, it, it's supposedly only part of the payment. The final amount that we committed to send to them was something like $1.4 billion. I mean, even in Washington, D.C., that's, that's real money. That's, that's serious money. money. We'll be right back with Gary Bauer. Stay tuned for more Truth For Our Time.
Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coach with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can return the grandkids, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We'll help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Hi, my name is David Burrier, your Hope Coach. I host a live weekly talk show called I've Been There every Thursday afternoon at 5.30, right here on webcast1live.com and on my weekly radio program Saturday mornings at 10 on Truth Network 99.3 FM. I interview common everyday people who have survived incredible life challenges and who testify to God's faithfulness in the midst of their storms. So join me as we bring a message of hope and encouragement. Everybody needs hope. I know, because I've been there. Hey everybody, I brought Northern Lights Pizza. And it's got Graziano sausage. Rockton Prevention is celebrating 25 years of creating a caring community. We want to say thank you to the tens of thousands of Rock High School mentors that have carried our message of health, love, and encouragement to over 1.5 million children, teachers, and parents. Our mentors teach children methods and skills to prevent bullying and drug use. Thank you to all the school administrators, teachers, and counselors for the opportunity to serve you. Rock on, fair citizens. Rock on. This is Pat McManus for Rock and Prevention, the Richard O. Jacobson Foundation, and this station. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Here is Scott on Truth For Our Time. Thank you for staying with us. I'm with Gary Bauer. We have just a couple minutes left with him. Gary, the platforms, Republican Party versus Democratic Party, uh, I know that you sent out an email, and for folks who want to take uh, the opportunity to get your emails, how might they sign up to subscribe? To ouramericanvalues.org, and uh, it, you can sign up there, and you'll get a daily report about a page or so about things happening in Washington that affects your family or your business or uh, your children and so forth. And so I know you have to run here shortly. Just let me know when you need to go. But the Republican and the Democratic platform, uh, the difference is I was surprised to see that the Democratic platform did speak out against, if I'm reading it correctly, according to your email, they did speak speak out against the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. Am I correct in that? Uh, I, I believe there is a reference to that uh, in, in the Democrat platform, and that's that's a good sign. The problem is that many of the groups that make up the, the, the Democratic Party are supporting right. uh, that that movement. So it's hard to know what what is real and what is just an effort to get votes. So, of course, as happens often in the De- Democratic Party, there is a disconnect of what they're saying on one hand, what they're doing and writing on one hand, and what's happening in the other hand or the other part of the party. It doesn't it doesn't bode well, and it doesn't con- complete itself in, in what the statement says. Yes. All right. Toward the Republican, I felt it was probably one of the strongest, most cohesive statements we've ever had on Israel. Well, well Tamara, you played a major role in that, and, and uh, Christians United for Israel Action Fund... Uh, was was involved. It, it, I believe it is the most pro-Israel uh, platform uh, in, in the history of either major uh, political party. And i i want to I want to make it clear to people, or just briefly explain to people that may not have the same commitment to Israel that you do and I do. That when we talk about supporting Israel, we're actually supporting the United States. Because uh, Israel is our most reliable ally throughout the Middle East. I would argue they're our most reliable ally in the world. Uh, Our two countries have stood together time and time again. Israel has never asked the United States to send our uh, fighting men and women to bail them out. They're perfectly capable of fighting their own wars. Uh, But they do ask for military equipment assistance. Assistance, and when we provide that, they tend to buy that equipment from 
uh, our defense industry. So the money comes back to the United States. So this is not charity to Israel. Uh, we rely on them for intelligence in the Middle East about what's going on. And the same enemies that we have are the enemies that Israel has. So the two countries uh, ought to remain close together. Unfortunately, President Obama, over these eight years, has tried to move away from Israel and tried to form alliances with the Islamic world. And uh, that has been a disaster, which anybody could have told him it, it would be. So uh, we're going to continue to fight on these issues. And uh and hope that on Election Day in November that the country goes in a, a different direction. Uh, Tamara, it's really great to be with you today. I wish, I wish I had more time, but unfortunately things are crazy here in Washington, D.C., as they usually are. Absolutely, and we appreciate you just jumping on with us for the short time that you could. Gary Bauer has been my guest. Gary, thank you so much as you take off. We wish you well and appreciate all that you do in D.C. on our behalf back here in the States. Thank you. God bless you, Tamara. All right. Folks, for those of you who are listening, that is Gary Bauer. And as you heard, if you'd like to get his newsletters, you can go to ouramericanvalues.org, ouramericanvalues.org, and you'll be able to sign on every day. He sends out something. It's not... It's not too long to read. It's not cumbersome. It's just a, a glimpse of, of what is happening politically, socially, culturally in the nation. And of course, it always has a um, biblical or a Christian aspect to it, which I always appreciate. So uh, we thank Gary Bauer for his expertise in sharing that with us. Now, today, here we go. I usually have the show stacked with guests, and here is why. Um, call it humility, call it, uh, I, I don't know. I don't feel like I, I don't feel like I want to, to fill the airwaves myself with my opinion. This is not about my opinion. My opinion doesn't matter. The only thing that matters as we tell you on this show is how you live God's word in today's world. That's the point of everything we do is, um, if God expects you to live through it, he's directed you how to do it somewhere in his word. So on this show, we always try and talk about uh, events and um, circumstances as they happen and what would be the take for us as a Christian. So if I'm going to talk to you, and I am, you'd think I would have written up something and had it prepared for you that I could just read from so I wouldn't say something clumsily and have someone upset or misquoting or uh, taking advantage to have something on air that I said that I didn't mean it the way I sounded, but I didn't. I'm just going to talk to you friend to friend. Uh, American to American, Iowan to Iowan, um, as we are dealing with these issues, uh, because there's too much at stake. There's too much happening. This is one of the most unique election cycles that I remember in my lifetime, but I don't think it's that unique overall. I think it's Ecclesiastes that tells us there's nothing new under the sun. I don't think that it's any nastier than it's been in years past. In fact, in some ways, I think it's less nastier because at least the comments are, are main. To me, they are still dealing with the folks in office and how they will operate. We're not electing a pastor, though we always try and get someone who will uphold our biblical principles. I think it was Charles Finney who was studying Blackstone's commentaries on the law to become an attorney. And by reading those commentaries, he read so much scripture that I believe he uh, became saved or what we call born again. And he made the comment that America would be blessed or cursed as a nation, according to how Christians themselves handle themselves in the nation. So what that means, Christians is one, yes, how we are involved politically, uh, the roles that we make, the actions that we take and how we treat those around us, but politically. But what it also means is how we treat those around us socially, culturally, as neighbors, as Christians. Because in my opinion, before we ever get to the political side of this, to the presidential nominations, there's a lot happening that we expect government to take care of and to fix that is our responsibility. Taking care of the poor taking care of the needy, the sick. That is our responsibility as Christians. And it's really easy to be generous with somebody else's money. But that's not what government is called to do. Government is not to be charitable. It's not to have a generous 
spirit. Government is supposed to be blind. Remember that justice is blind and it's supposed to uphold good and punish bad. That's it. And here's why. If you have a community or a small church, you know the lady who needs help, the widow who needs some aid, uh, someone who might be ill. The government has no idea. By the time somebody gets her to the right department to fill out the papers, the papers get sent. Before the aid ever gets there, it's likely too late. There's room for fraud. No one really knows who they are or what they're doing or if they really need help or if they really need a lifestyle change and they could become more uh, self-independent. But you see that when you're in a community, when you're in a church. And if there's a lifestyle that needs changed, a church can help someone do that. I drive through the communities here in Iowa. We have 99 counties. And at every county seat, it seems I, it, it, it seems I see the courthouse in the square, town square. And then around the square are the businesses. And then within the next block, there are usually some beautiful old church buildings right there next to the businesses, next to the business and industry zoned areas. You see, today we push those churches out of the city limits, which might be some of the issues with the the cities, frankly. They push them outside city limits. Why? Zoning. They don't want that non-taxable property inside city limits. They want to be able to tax it. They want to be able to get the top dollar for tax, uh, taxable properties next to a roadway or a highway or an interstate or a busy intersection. They don't want to give up that greed. They don't want to give up that property that they could get a taxable income off a corporation or a business to a church. Well, see, they're missing. There's so much missing. The investment that that church, if it's proper, if it's biblical, if it's doing its job and its role as a church, pays back into the community. Because what they might be missing in that income, they might be gaining in services and teaching that help their community members be stronger, make better decisions, be better employees, be better business owners, be more creative in the image of God. But we've whisked all those churches outside city limits. And it's hurt us. I liked it better when we knew what we were doing and we appreciated the churches. Now, Goose, you're giving me the signal, and I think I should have till 32 after. Yeah, we're still good? All right. <laughs> Very good. We have till uh, just a couple more minutes. Um, those churches, when they're doing their job, can help families be stronger. We know when the family is healthy, society benefits. When the family is unhealthy or broken, society pays the cost. I'd love to see us welcome the churches back in the communities, but even more, I'd love to see the churches be instrumental in the communities. Too many churches have gotten about what happens in their sanctuaries. They're all wrapped up in their contemporary versus their uh, classical music. The debate rages and the sermons seem to suffer. The service has disappeared. It's about taking Christ outside that building, not to push our faith or our religion on anyone else, but to show the love of Christ to all we meet and that there's a better way than what they might be having or living. That's what we've lost in a community. And the truth of it is, is that politics are downstream from the culture. If we could fix a lot of these issues once again in the culture, then we wouldn't have to be dealing with them in politics. I don't know why we expect a candidate to be perfect when we celebrate the very imperfections we criticize that candidate about or on in our culture. We'll talk about some of those issues when we come back after the break, because I now I think we do only have a minute or two left. And I just lost my earpiece. But we'll talk about that in a minute. But think this through. 
no matter what the laws are, you can outlaw something, and that's what they keep telling us on abortion, that if we outlaw abortion, that then they'll just have abortions in the back room clinics and the alleys, and we don't know. Uh, you know, Obviously, there may be some who are determined to break the law. That's true, to take the life of another. That's true, but it would be fewer and far between. And what a better message to send our folks about the value of life, the dignity of life, and even more, not just that accidents happened or that someone might get pregnant, but that if we wait on those relationships, when that pregnancies occur, you are ready and prepared and eager and able to take care of a child and welcome them in the world. What a better way of thinking about it. I hear the music. We've got to take a break. For those of you who are listening, this is Truth For Our Time on 99.3 FM. And you can hear us at 10 a.m. Fridays Live on webcastonelive.com. Stay tuned. We'll be right back and talk more about this. Northern Lights Pizza's amazing garlic butter makes amazing breadsticks. Now available in 12-ounce bottles at Northern Lights, hy V and Graziano's. Northern Lights Pizza. I'm Brian Leach, owner of Service Legends, and my position is Chief Talent Officer. I'm Nicholas Wondershide. I am Bernie Hobbs. And I'm the Service Manager. Marketing Director and Client Relations Manager. Everything that we do is about ensuring that we exceed your expectations. Our clients are important to us. 100% satisfaction. We're not just focused on heating and cooling. That's the easiest part of our job, actually, is fixing furnaces and air conditioners. Everyone that we come in touch with, we want to improve lives. Bottom line is, we've got our installation guarantees, 25% energy savings guarantee, comfort guarantee, temperature selection guarantee, property protection guarantee. 100% satisfaction guaranteed, fixed rate or it's free. All of those guarantees are backed up with a 100% money back guarantee to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that you get what you're after. Just fixing the problem today, if they have another problem five days down the road, it's still a fixed rate or it's free. We use what's called straightforward pricing. Our technicians are gonna give you an exact to the penny price on what it's gonna take before they move forward with any repair. That way you know what to expect. It's the same price every day. No surprises. If you get off work at five o'clock in the afternoon, you come home, you realize that, oh, my furnace is broken. Now you need to call somebody out that night. You shouldn't have to pay more for that. We're guaranteeing service 24-7. We run afternoons, evenings, nights, weekends. We're staffed to work that. Phone rings at 3 in the morning. You'll get one of our representatives answering the phone every time. We're not sending you out to Timbuktu in some call center. It's our service legend team members, our mission control team. I'll take a call anytime. And then they answer the phones the same way during the day as they do at night. It's a great day at your service company. How can we make you smile? That's the only way to provide true 24-hour service. When you're able to let somebody actually live in their home safely when they weren't able to do that before, where they don't have to stay up at night and worry about, is the heat going to come back on? Are we going to freeze the pipes? Is the baby in the room next door going to be sick because they got too cold? When you're able to help somebody overcome challenges like that, that's impacting a life. That makes a difference. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I love the team. I love the people that I work with. <laughs> we have fun, but we work hard. I call them my ambassadors of legendary service. If you could just envision what that is, that's who we're sending to your home. They literally will call in, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I want to talk to your manager. And I get on the phone, they're like, that technician that was at my house was the greatest technician ever. That's cool to me. We want to brighten people's days. Every person that we have going into the house has gone through an extensive background check. Drug testing, we have a very thorough interview process that one out of 140 people make it through. If we promise you something, that's what you're going to get, no matter what. We're here when you need us to protect the safety and comfort of your family. If you're not happy, we're gonna make it right. If we're willing to put 100% money back guarantee on what we do, what type of work do you think we do? Give us a call. We're there for you 24-7, 365 days a year. Enough said. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. And thanks for staying with us. I am Tamara Scott. You're listening to Truth For Our Time on 98.3 FM, the Truth Network in Central Iowa, and Webcast One Live.com on Fridays. You can join us at 10 a.m., and you can usually call in to join us, um, 515-244-0077. Now, we're talking about um, the, the election, and I'm going to talk to you, my fellow believers, my fellow evangelicals, my fellow Christians out there, because there seems to be some really interesting conversations on this year's candidate. I would, I would caution any of us, uh, we've been so thrilled this past several elections to have some great evangelical, conservative, constitutionally minded candidates running. And it's been rather refreshing 
right? If we think back, everybody talks about Reagan as being the candidate, but if you look back, Reagan wasn't all that conservative when he started out. He was in the Democratic Party, probably a conservative Democrat, but he was even pro-choice, as I'm told, and became more gradually conservative as he saw the role of government and as he saw God in his life after his assassination tape attempt on his life, he sim- he certainly became more conservative. My point to you is understand how these folks may grow, the possibilities there, and are we better off to help build someone up as a Christian, or do we tear them down constantly? How are you behaving while people are watching you on Facebook? I am stunned. I am disappointed. I am sometimes downright disgusted with some of my fellow believers throughout this cycle. Oddly enough, and even some in this building and on radio themselves who will criticize a candidate for their foul mouth or their filthiness will then put out a tweet that is so disgustingly horrible that wouldn't be allowed in my house. My mother would wash somebody's mouth out with soap. It wouldn't matter how old they were. If she were 90 in a wheelchair, she'd be tracking them down. This is uncalled for, and it's not Christian behavior. But we mock and ridicule someone who we say isn't a Christian. We say they're not, their faith isn't real, though they may sell, call themselves a Christian. And my point is, are you better off um, list, helping them along in their faith or criticizing them and knocking them down? Think that through. If you had somebody come to your church and they were new in their faith, would you criticize them and mock them for something they got wrong, a mispronunciation? Or would you help them along? Now, Donald Trump has made some very interesting pledges. And let's just go through some of those. Because, yes, we have uncertainties with Donald. I, I'm, go- I'm going to be very clear about that. We sure do. But we have certainties with Hillary Clinton. She has fomented what we're seeing in, in, in this nation as far as unrest and, and anger. He's tapped into it. That's true. But she fomented it and stirred it up. Let me just go you through this list very quickly with you. Uh, With Hillary and Obama, are racial tensions better or worse? We talked about Black Lives Matter earlier in the program, and certainly we want to do all we can for every race, and that's the difference with us here on the Republican Party, us as Christians. We certainly don't. (laughs) Let me just shut off my phone. We certainly don't. We don't try to isolate people. I think it was Huckabee said it best when he ran in 2008. Democrats will try and pitch you in groups so they can pitch you against each other and put the power in the group, but they, by pitting you against each other, they polarize you, and by polarizing us, then they can paralyze us, and we certainly see that. The Democrat platform I just talked about with Gary Bauer a little bit puts us into class warfare. In fact, let me see if I can find that. I think I have it with me. This is, um, for those of you watching, I'm holding it up, but it's a uh, uh, um, oh, wrong paper. It is from the Senate Democrats right here in Iowa. The Senate Democrats are under control, have have control of the Iowa Senate. And this was last spring, 427, 2015. Leaders of the Iowa Senate today released a state budget outline which would would expand Iowa's middle class while maintaining fiscal responsibility. Senate budget priorities focus on expanding Iowa's middle class. Think that through. Do you want the government deciding what class you get to be in? deciding if they're going to expand it or not, and whether they get expanded and let some lower-class folks come up or maybe take some higher-end class down. This is not government's role. It is, this is pitting government against the people. Government shouldn't be deciding what class we're in or what size any class is, but that's what happens when Democrats are in control. They can't help themselves. It's a power lust, and they think they're doing good for the people by determining what your outcome is going to be. When they talk about equality and they're trying to talk about outcome, that will not, that what they do is penalize people and restrict you. When they promise entitlements to you, those are entanglements. And Goose, I don't want to overstep here, but we've talked before. Henry Ford says, if you want to see what happens when the government takes care of you, look at the Indian and the reservation. They've been re- limited and restricted. Their creativity is gone. Their job opportunities are gone. Their purpose has been diminished because they're not allowed to fulfill all the giftings that God might otherwise give them. We see that so clearly in that instance. Your entitlements from the government will limit what you can make. We already see it with this war on the $15 um, uh, minimum wage out west where they've already put it in place. We're hearing that folks are now saying, hey, 
I don't want to work as many hours as I worked last week because I'll lose my benefits from the government. See, they keep you in tow. They keep you in that class where if you'd shake those off, get rid of those bonds of this new slavery from the Democratic Party, you would have the freedom to set forward your own limitations and to rise to the ability of your work ethic, your creativity, your intellectual power, whatever your, whatever your limits may be, they'd be between you and God, not your government. And that's the disappointing factor with me on this. And boy, oh boy, here I thought, what am I going to do with all this time? And I'm looking at the clock, Goose, and I'm worried I'm going to run out of time already. Racial tensions are worse. And as I started to point out in the Bible, Acts 17, 26, God did this so that man, let's see, let's see, let's see, 26, from one man we made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. We believe one creator, one God. It is the evolutionist and the Democrats and the left who want to pit us against each other with their racist uh, ideals and, and men, mentality. Uh, women, 37% more women in poverty with Hillary and Obama at the top. Uh, relations, she's the Secretary of State. Relations with foreign countries, name one, where we have a better relationship. There isn't one. In fact, our enemies, uh, we've alienated uh, our allies, we've enabled our enemies, we've abandoned our veterans, the VA, I don't need to even say anything about that. We've disbanded our military, they're at an all-time low as far as resources, um, numbers, they need our help, not uh, our hindrance. And, and let's just talk about Benghazi. There was a lot of ridicule over Trump and his taking issue with the Khan family. He didn't take issue with the soldier and the sacrifice at all. But when they themselves tried to exploit it and made it go political, because Trump stood up, we now know that he, Mr. Khan, is affiliated with the Clintons through the law firm in which he works. He's written several papers uh, supporting Sharia law. And if you know anything about Sharia law, you now know that many believe that it usurps all other law, including the U.S. Constitution. So the very thing that he was shaking in the camera and challenging a Trump on, he himself likely would not uphold if he believes in Sharia law. They are contradictory and cannot coexist. Why didn't he shake that constitution at Hillary Clinton at Barack Obama, who took an oath to protect it, unlike Trump, who hasn't yet? And they've broken it. Both of them have broken it. She abandoned Christians in America and Americans in Benghazi, and Trump says he'll do neither. He'll build up the military so we can defeat our enemies. He'll talk about the terms of engagement or the rules of engagement so that they don't have to wait to be fired up upon and be the victim before they can defend themselves. Hillary, not so much on either of those accounts. So let's talk about Trump, and I only have two minutes left before this break. I hear the ridicule, the photos of his wife. And again, when I talked about culture earlier, if you don't like it in the culture, deal with it. But that same week that many came out and criticized this from other campaigns back in the primary was the same week that Kardashian put out her little nude fest on Twitter. And no one decided to criticize that. Orlando Bloom apparently has some foul photos out there right now. No one's criticizing that. In fact, the same news media that will now malign a Melania for tr- photos taken years ago at the same newscast will celebrate another individual for doing something similar, a celebrity in Hollywood. These are contradictions, and we don't need to take the bait as Christians in society. We need to stand strong against it in all culture, not just when we decide we're going to go against a particular candidate because it suits our political fancy. We've got to take another break. When we come back, we'll talk more about this. And I want to get to a biblical portion on this as well, because many of you are struggling. We'll be right back. There's so much more I could say. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can return the grandkids, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We'll help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. 
Rockton Prevention is celebrating 25 years of creating a caring community. We want to say thank you to the tens of thousands of Rock High School mentors that have carried our message of health, love, and encouragement to over 1.5 million children, teachers, and parents. Our mentors teach children methods and skills to prevent bullying and drug use. Thank you to all the school administrators, teachers, and counselors for the opportunity to serve you. Rock on, fair citizens. Rock on. This is Pat McManus for Rock and Prevention, the Richard O. Jacobson Foundation, and this station. Northern Lights Pizza, your home of the tasty crust. Our garlic butter sauce now available in 12-ounce bottles at Northern Lights, Hy-Vee, and Graziano. Northern Lights Pizza. Hi, my name is David Burrier, your Hope Coach. I host a live weekly talk show called I've Been There every Thursday afternoon at 5.30, right here on webcast1live.com and on my weekly radio program Saturday mornings at 10 on Truth Network 99.3 FM. I interview common everyday people who have survived incredible life challenges and who testify to God's faithfulness in the midst of their storms. So join me as we bring a message of hope and encouragement. Everybody needs hope. I know, because I've been there. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Well, it's kind of intimidating to know that you have blank airtime to fill. And yet here I am wishing I had more because I'm down to my last eight minutes with you. I am Tamara Scott. You're listening to Truth For Our Time. We're talking about the political landscape. And yes, turn your hearing aids to high speed because we're going to roll now. I'm running out of time. I want to run through Donald Trump. Because of all the criticism, he's hearing you. He's responsive. Haven't we wanted a candidate for a long, long time who would listen to us? When he heard the uh, the complaints of the Christian community, which, by the way, treated him very coldly, he responded warmly, which is more than I can say for many of them. He had that event. We've talked about it on this show. Evangelicals, a thousand of them. He answered their questions. He has now an advisory committee, a very high-level, um, influential, uh, grounded, biblically grounded um, advisors uh, from the evangelical community. We've never had that happen before. He put out his list for the Supreme Court of judges that he would choose from, pro-life justices, that the Heritage Foundation and uh, the Federal Society has approved. Never had a candidate do that before. Um, he has promised to end the war on Christianity. We've never had a candidate be so bold. He brought up the Johnson Amendment. Never had a presidential candidate Take that on head on, and that might make some pastors really uncomfortable because they'd actually have no excuse not to preach the full gospel and connect the dots from the Bible to our culture. And he recently signed an anti-porn pledge with Enough is Enough, Donna Rice Hughes, that organization, maybe because of some of the photos that his wife has been in years and years and years ago. Folks, think back. Would you do something differently now than what you did years ago? Is there anything that you wish you might not have done years ago? I don't know if she feels that way or not. My point is none of us are perfect. Each of you out there who are married, did you marry someone who is absolutely perfect in every way and they're always right? No, you didn't. And there may be a few exceptions, but for the most part, aren't you glad you married them anyway? If the person you chose to spend the rest of your life with is not perfect, and you still chose them to raise kids with them, then how do you get off deciding that someone who's going to be in charge of your country for only eight years must also be perfect? It's a high bar. Yes, we want the best we absolutely can have, but here's the deal. No one should have the power that Obama has had to destroy this country if Congress were doing their job. The reason that Trump has had such a rise is because Congress has failed so dismally. Republicans as well as Democrats. They like, voters like what he's saying. There's hope, there's promise that someone will stand against us and put an end to it. And I think that's why you're seeing the media come out against him so strongly. A fabricated story this week on the RNC. Remember, I am National Committee Woman for the Republican Party of Iowa, and certainly I don't know everything or most things happening in the Republican Party at the national level. But... I could tell you, that I just didn't think there was any legs to this one whatsoever. Maybe a few might have been investigating for their own selfish whims. But there was no one 
to my knowledge, talking about replacing Donald Trump as our nominee. Why did the media bring that up? Greg Stephanopoulos, who was a Clinton press house, White, a White House press secretary, who has given money, large sums of money, to the Clintons, whether it's their foundation, perhaps even her campaign, I don't know. But obviously he's sold out. We know the media is sold out. They are the Hillary support staff. Why did they run with the story? There could be a multitude of reasons that cause a disruption, that cause a disrest, because they are concerned they can't beat Trump. But if they can defeat you as his supporters, that's their best hope. Don't buy what the media is selling. Don't fall privy to those polls. We saw it with Brexit. We're going to see it again. We saw it in elections 2004. The polls did not reflect what the results showed. Don't buy it. Why did they run with it? I think it might be more than that. Because while Republicans are not looking to replace their nominee, Democrats may have to. With WikiLeaks and more and more coming out about treasonous behavior from the candidate Hillary Clinton, Democrats may very well have to replace their nominee. So if the media can do their job and create a big scandal over Republicans, create the alarm and the shock, then when it turns out to be nothing and it really does have to happen on the Democrat side, it won't be such an issue. The shock will have worn off. And the masses, they hope, will take it better. That's just one thought. If the, if the media can speculate and put out foolishness before you, why can't we just speculate a little bit? I think there may be some truth to that. They very well may have to replace their candidate. And isn't it unfortunate that we have to go to WikiLeaks to get information about what's happening in our own government? As I said on Facebook, is it there not one reporter out there, an, ins, an investigative reporter who would who is not assigned to dig through the Trump dumpster, but could actually do some real work on these issues. Not a one of them is concerned about weapons sold. 33,000 emails gone. The FBI director not indicting her, but dancing all over it, talking about all of the risks, the classified information, the misinformation, the downright lies. Think that through. When your best slogan for your candidate is, she wasn't indicted. I get the uncertainties with a Trump. You have certainties with a Hillary. As a Christian, what should you be doing for your nation? And so for those of you who are struggling with this, let me just take this on a little bit spiritually, and I hope you'll hear my heart on this. Not in any way comparing Donald Trump to the Messiah, but hear me out on this. And there are five reasons that folks are going along with this. Some is pride. They just can't imagine that their guy didn't get checked, selected. There's a little bit of a stick nif- stick nif- stick necked, stiff necked issue there. We call it stiff necked as a biblical term. And some of them have other agendas. Pride. They'd rather be invited to the White House. They don't care who's in charge as long as they still have the invitation to the White House. We see that Harvard Republicans today set out something that they're not going to support Trump. Well, we've all known where the Harvard, Harvard School was a long time ago. Their roots were biblical, but they've been little since. Thank you for showing us who you are. For those of us who have been praying for truth to be revealed and falsehoods to be exposed, it's happening, folks, this this cycle. But that's not a bad reflection on Trump. That's why they all don't like him, because he doesn't fall to their old school, big old um, boys club ways. He doesn't need them. They couldn't control him financially in the primary. He didn't buy his way to the White House, which was my fear. He spent less than most other candidates. This is a movement of the people. So there's pride. That's one of the reasons others won't come along right now. Some of your Christian friends, by the way, there's some arrogance. They just can't imagine this guy. He doesn't fit their mold. It's not what they would have chosen. And kid yourself not, it's not that their principles are holding them back. If they thought they had a position with a campaign, they'd jump tomorrow. They're posturing for a position, not their principles. Fear. I get some of you may be fearful. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Listen to your Holy Spirit. The whole vote your conscience thing was a ruse, but I certainly tell you, you should absolutely vote your conscience. Pray it through, and I hope I get time to get to my other point. I don't know if I'm going to. Religiosity, and that's what we're seeing so much in so many of our leaders and talk show hosts. The spirit of religiosity, they're just so judgmental. And then I will get to my animosity, whether it's animosity for this country. They'd rather see this nation judged, like Jonah sitting under the bush whining. He didn't want uh, 
asked Nineveh to repent. He wanted God to smite them. And you're seeing that, unfortunately, in some of your Christian brothers and sisters. So I'm going to hop very quickly to this. I have to go up 55.50, don't I? You're going to have, I have 10 seconds left. You're going to have to stay tuned. We're going to have to come back to this point. Another show. I hate to do this to you. Join us next week. We'll start with this issue. I'm Tamara Scott. You've been listening to Truth For Our Time.